So today we are continuing with our series. It's part six of the series of Acts. As you remember, this is the sixth week, and um, you all will agree with me that Acts is one of the, the, the very wonderful books in the New Testament. It teaches us how the church was established. So we have seen from the very beginning in the first series um, how the power was promised, how the power was proclaimed, how the church started. And last week we went through um, the, the power of praying in unity. So today we are going to continue and um, we are going to cover a part which is called perse persecution. Um, as you know, you know we are, when, when we think of the book of Acts, there are so many good things that were happening. A lot of good things that were happening in terms of um, the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, miracles, signs, and so many things. So, 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 so sometimes this part of um, the opposition that the church was getting sometimes doesn't come out well. Sometimes we don't think of it as much, but uh, in this book, Paul is trying to tell us that even though all these things were happening, but there was persecutions. Those people were claiming, proclaiming the name of uh, the gospel, the name of God, strengthening the church. A lot of them were persecuted. So we need to, to understand it and we need to see how God, even in these hard times, can still use his church to strengthen uh, the gospel, to continue to enrich the gospel. So today we are going to hear or we are going to cover um, persecution can come to those who proclaim his name and will enable the gospel expansion. So that's going to be the theme of our series today. Um, I want us to turn to the book of Acts, chapter 4, and we'll be reading from first verse to verse number 4. The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was the evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. So we see that even though these people were put in jail, but still God could use that message was, which, was, uh, which was preached to increase the number. 5,000 people received Jesus Christ that day. And we'll continue to see in this uh, chapter 4 how further, what happened um, uh, in, 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 in that church during that time where there was so much opposition. In John 15, we are reminded also, the Bible is full of uh, these remarks on how um, we have to expect persecution. Jesus said, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. So this is something that is not new. This is something that we don't have to to think that it will not happen to us as long as you are a Christian and our mission, you know, even the, the mission of our church, God's tribe is to make sure that the gospel is spread. So if you're a Christian and you're sitting, not sharing the gospel, not trying to uh, teach other people, not trying to just proclaiming the, the, the name of Jesus, Maybe you might not face this opposition. Maybe you might not face persecution. But if uh, you go out there telling your colleagues at work, at workplace, or even your neighbor, imagine if this neighbor is a Muslim and you are trying to share the gospel of Jesus, definitely you are going to face some opposition. And uh, these things are happening. It was happening in those years, but these things are also happening today. Uh, you might not know, but according to the, 
to the International Society for Human Rights. 80% of the opposition of violence against religions is directed towards Christians. Not any other religion, not Muslims, not Hindus, but towards Christians. But now the problem is, these are, the not, th these are not things that we see every day in our televisions. It's not well captured. These are not things that we are getting uh, informed. So every day, there are more than 100 million Christians who, somewhere in the world, they are facing opposition. Whether it's discrimination, whether it's persecution, whether it's interrogation, sometimes even arrest, sometimes these people are also put in death. You all know what is happening in places like Iran, places like Syria, places like Korea, Indonesia, even in Africa, places like Nigeria, you know, with Boko Haram. So much is happening against Christians. A lot of people are dying because of their faith. Just an example, um, in Iran, you remember back in the early 90s, when the, the, the GAFO was starting, there are over 1.5 million Christians. But if you go to Iran today, which is about uh, 25 years later, there are less, uh, less than 100,000 Christians because most of them, either they had to flee the country, either they were persecuted, or either they had just to convert to other religions. So, so, so these things are still real. Um, if you go to North Korea today, over 70,000 Christians are in jail because of their faith. And uh, another statistic that when I was preparing for the sermon that I got is that about every 10 minutes, there are two Christians who are dying, who are murdered because of their faith. Every 10 minutes, imagine. That means in one hour, you are talking of how many? 10 times, uh, 6 times 2. As 12. So that goes every hour, every day, every week, every year. People are dying because of, of their faith. But we get courage that even though we face all these opposition, but God still can use us. God still can, can use the church to expand the mission uh, that Jesus came to, to do. Um, we all know that all these years since, uh, since we, uh, Jesus was on earth, a lot of Christians have died. And uh, something that was striking me that over 70 million people died. And a lot of them, half of them died in the last 100 years. Just the last century. All, most of these deaths are, have happened. So that means as we are going forward, these things are still going to happen and it may be even uh, closer to us, or even more, if you look at the history of the church. The more we proclaim, the more position we get, the more we decide, even here in God's tribe, if we decide saying that every one of us has to go out there and just share the, 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 the gospel, just share about Jesus to your neighbor, or to someone you know who is not converted, who is not a Christian, definitely will start to hear more cases of opposition. This is how, uh, during the, 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 the past years, um, you know, Christians were fed to lions. If you look at the back, these, those, those fire, those are people who were burned during the, the time of Nero. It was, it, was, it was something that was happening every day. People were burnt, people were killed because of their faith. Even now, you can see some of the news. This was CNN, which was saying ISIS ex uh, executes dozens of Christians. That's why you can see there is so much migrant of people leaving Syria, leaving some other countries, going to Europe because they are running away from these persecutions. So these things are real. Um, this map is showing 
it's one of the recent map that is showing where do Christians face most persecution. And you can see the red color is almost all over the world. Everywhere, even somewhere in Australia, somewhere in America, especially in the Middle East, in China, all these things are happening. Even in Japan, you can see the islands there. These things are happening. So just as for us to be aware that persecution is real and it's happening. Uh, what do we need to do now? First of all, we need to be informed. We need to know that these things are happening and pray for those who are being persecuted. There is a book that I would recommend. It's called The Global War on Christians. It's by John Allen. It's trying to show how these things are happening, where they're happening, but giving also some testimony from people who have been persecuted. It's one of the very deep books. I'm also looking forward to read it, but I've just read some summaries of it, showing that these things are real, but God, the power of God to, to come in the midst of these persecutions and enable the church to grow. So, in brief, I want us to go through some key issues, some key um, things that the church during that time did so that we can learn also how to respond to these persecutions. So the first, they affirming their commitment to God. That was the first thing that they did. If we read from Acts 4, chapter 24, 23 to 24, when they were released, at the beginning when we were reading, it's when they were captured, they were put to jail overnight, and the number of Christians grew. But later, when we go to chapter 23, when they were released, Peter and John went to their fellow believers and reported everything the high priest and the elder had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voice to God with one mind and said, Master of all, you who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them, who said by the Holy Spirit, through your servant David and forefather. So we see that they did not run away. They were not crying. They were not hiding. But they went to their people and they started proclaiming the word of God, the name of God. They went back and started praying to God, affirming their commitment to God. And how did they do that? They did it through corporate prayer. I remember... Uh, my brother Fisher, he said when he was talking about the prayers that it is important to, to do whatever we can to participate in this corporate prayer in our church. Why, 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 why are we stressing corporate prayer? First of all, because corporate prayer makes us focus on God. When you are praying by yourself, sometimes, yes, you focus on God, but a lot of times we focus on ourselves, we focus on our problem, we focus on the daily issues. But if you see the way they prayed, first of all, they raise their voices and they affirm their commitment to God, giving God's praise. So that's what corporate prayer does. The next thing, corporate prayer brings answers. If we in your Bibles, if you go to Acts uh, 4.31, just a continuation of the story, say that when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God courageously. This part of the, this part of the, of the scripture is called praying for courage or for boldness. So you can see that the corporate prayer is very important to bring answers. It's not that when you are praying by yourself, you don't get answers, but many times in the Bible we have been seeing when people come together and pray, things are happening. The world has been shaken, things were moving, and they, they were more capable to continue to spread the word of God. So that's how God strengthened them. Because they came together, they believed in him. Even today, uh, the, the number of songs, the number of songs that we are listening, they are all uh, 
directing us to look at Jesus Christ, directing us to look at God. Even, even the Swahili song was saying, Kwake um, Yesu nasimama ndiye mwamba. That in Jesus is where I stand because he is my fortress. He is my, uh, my lighthouse. He is my anchor. He is my rock. So when we face all these oppositions, we have to remember that. Um, we have to remember Jesus Christ. We have to remember that we belong to God. We have to pray together so that God can strengthen us to be more powerful, to be more bold uh, in uh, sharing the gospel. The second, they affirm their commitment to God by affirming, um, by having high view on God, on the sovereignty of the Lord, even over evil. So, it's amazing that all the time when they are facing opposition, they were not condemning those people who were opposing them. They were not arguing or trying to, to tell them, you know, you guys, this is... They explained to them that we cannot follow you guys. We cannot listen to what you guys are saying. You have seen the miracle that Jesus did. A and there is no way you can, you can say nothing happened because you saw people were healed. You saw the miracles happening. So they understood that all the opposition we are getting, it's, um, it's the devil. Whenever we are trying to, uh, whenever we are trying to, to proclaim the word of God. We are praying to, to show that Jesus is the Lord. Definitely the devil doesn't like that. And the devil will always do whatever he can. Using anybody, even in, within your family. Some of us, even our families, we've had a number of testimony here. That even our families, by coming here, they, they don't understand us. And it's, they are prob it's not them. It's the devil trying to... Um, to use them to, to weaken us, to use them to, to, to discourage us, to oppose us. So we get this opposition from the, from the devil. And how else they did it to affirming their commitment to God, but they, they, they did use, um, they applied the word of God. We can see when you continue to read in... Um, Acts 20, uh, 25. Who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius, Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. This is, uh, this is in Psalm number two. So you can see they use some of the words in the Bible, in the scriptures, to continue to affirming their commitment to God. That means they knew the word of God. And I uh, just want to remind them that it's very important to, uh, to pray in scriptures. It's very important to remember some of the, 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 the words uh, the, 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 the scripture is saying when you are praying, just to, to quote some of the, of the scriptures. And as we see uh, the way these people did during the time when they were opposed, during the time when they were prosecuted, they remembered some, uh, some words in Psalms and they raised their voices saying, this is what David said. We knew that we are going to face these uh, oppositions, but we know that what you did during that time when uh, those opposition came. And finally, also, how they affirmed their commitment to God, they did it by uh, looking to imitating Jesus as God's holy servant. This is very important because sometimes you hear people are doing a lot of things, but they give credits to themselves. A lot of church, you go, you hear that this is a servant of God is doing miracles. This is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a powerful man of God. And all the credit is towards that person. 
I don't want to mention the names of some of the pastors when you hear the way they are saying that they are doing miracles. Last week I was in Arusha and uh, I visited a friend of mine who at, at some point we prayed for, 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 for her. She's facing a problem um, we call uh, neuro, neuromuscular disorder where you just start losing, uh, you are losing the power of your, your body, you know, like right now after one year, she doesn't, she, even, even she cannot walk properly. Just, she's just losing the power of her body, like nerves are just, and it's, it's very sad. So she was telling me one day she went to this church after being convinced that they will pray for her, and um, she was so disappointed. She said, I, I, I've just lost hope because people have been praying for me, but this one was just too much. These people, they went, I went there, they just forced me to accept that I'm healed. They are just slapping me, you know, left and right, and they are just laughing and saying that I've been healed, and they are forcing me to walk, and they left me there just celebrating that I'm healed, and she was not healed. And, uh, and this person was just saying that he has that power. But when you look at the, at the scripture this morning, we see that it was all directed to Jesus Christ. If you look at, uh, from, from verse 27, this is how they were praying. They were praying for boldness, and they say, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do uh, whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may seek your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonder may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So all these things were happening, they knew that it's not because of them. They're asking God to give them the power to do all these miracles, to understand the word, to use the word, but also saying that signs and wonder may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus, not through their name as uh, the apostles. So, so this, is, this is, is very important. We, have all, we always have to remember that all these things are supposed to be happening because of, the, of, of Jesus. He's the one who does the miracles. He's the one who does the healing. He's the one who does uh, the wonders. He's the one who moves the gospel. We are, he's using us as instruments. So let's not get disappointed when you pray and things are not happening. Just trust in him. When we are facing opposition, let's trust in him and make sure that we wait for his time. Because um, as, as we heard that we are praying, but it's, it's, it's Jesus who gives the answers. It has his will. The second thing that they did was to affirm their commitments to the Lord's people. Commitments to God, and the second was commitments to Lord's people. I want you to try to imagine, when you're trying to imagine Peter and John, it's like elders in the church. These are the leaders. These are the people who are teaching. So when they were put into jail, and the time they came out, they did not run away. They did not go and hide somewhere where people cannot find. Because you are threatened to death, I showed you the pictures. That was waiting for them. You know the Bible. These people were being killed, were being put on fire, fed to the lions. So I imagined myself, it was me, and then now you are out. The first thing was just to take a bus and go somewhere else where nobody can find me. But they did not do that. They went straight to their people. 
And they told them what happened. They told them everything. They, they, they were excited. I can see them excited, saying, you know, these guys, they took us in, and then we just told them about Jesus, and they left us. They couldn't find any fault. And they were excited, and they started praying together. So here we learn that we should always be committed to the unit and the community that we are in. If something happens, it's good to come and share with the people that you are together with. That's why we always encourage um, people to come and give testimonies. Because this empowers us. If you are having a problem, we encourage that you come and share with us so that we can pray together. Because corporate prayers bring results. And, and, and throughout uh, the year that I've been with God, so we've seen a lot of good things are happening when people pray together. When we say, let's pray for this and answers come. And also, for those who have, uh, have read this book, you see how these people are committed to generosity. They were giving for the sake of the community. If you read, continue to read this, uh, this book from chapter 4 to chapter 5, you can see that during all this time of opposition, they were coming and staying together, sharing what they have, just showing commitment to Lord's people because they understood that whatever we have is not your own. Everything belongs to God and trusted you to share with others. Uh, the third thing that they did was to affirm their commitments to Lord's work in the world. When they did not run away or fall in pity, saying, you know what, we are discouraged, cannot do this anymore, Jesus was doing this because he's the son of God, you know, he's empowered by God. So for us, this is not for us. But in Acts, uh, in Acts chapter 4, verse 33, we read that with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They are giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They were... This is exactly what they said when they were arrested. They continue to give testimony. Even in their prayer, they continue to give testimony of the Lord's work in the world. And this is what we are supposed to do. When we are facing opposition, let us not forget of what God has done in this world. Let us not forget as how God raised Jesus Christ. Let us not forget on all the good things that Lord is doing in our lives. Let's continue to trust. Let's continue to, as we are saying this morning, let's continue to say Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is our anchor. Jesus is, our eyes should be focused on Jesus, even during the, the, the opposition. I would like to quote John Wesley, who said, If we suffer persecution and afflictions, in the right manner, we attain a large measure of conformity to Christ. By a due improvement of ones of these occasions, than we could have done mostly by imitating his mercy in a badness of good works. So, so, so Wesley is trying to tell us that sometimes just by taking it easy, let things flow the way they are supposed to flow, just like that, slowly. Come to church on Sunday, you go to work. Sometimes it's hard to fulfill the commission that we have. Sometimes opposition, saying, if we suffer persecutions and affliction in a right manner, we attain larger measure of conformity to Christ. Just want to give you an example 
for the men. Are you, are you, are you, are you there, men? <laughs> I believe every one of us at some point tried to, tried to grow your muscles. Eh? The six-pack, which is almost there for me. <laughs> uh, last week I read a t-shirt saying I have a six-pack, but it's, it's, uh, it's shy. <laughs> <laughs> so you remember when you are trying to grow your muscle, what do you do? Eh? You have to train it. You have to, to pull heavy things. You have to put it in opposition. When you are, you know, in the gym, you know, there are those machines where you pull, but you pull not to the direction of where the force is, but to pull up to oppose that force. So the opposition is the one which is making your muscle to grow. Do you agree with me? It's only through the opposition is where your muscle can grow. You cannot grow your muscle by eating, sitting and eating popcorn <laughs> and some juicy. Your muscle will, will not grow. So you, you always have to, to make sure that there is opposition in the, the muscles if you want them to grow. So it's the same. It's the same as if we grow our, want to grow our faith, let us not be afraid of sharing the word of God. Let's be open to share with uh, the fellow people who are not converted, people who don't know Jesus Christ. Because definitely when you do that, you're going to face opposition. But the word that we have gone through today, just give us the encouragement, give us the the way God did to these people, that through this opposition, he still used the church to grow, to spread his word. So it's not in your power. Sometimes I hear my brother Offense, Offense is not here today, when he says we are going to Pemba. I'm like, where? You know, Pemba, 99% are Muslims. So when you are going to Pemba to proclaim the word of God, to proclaim the name of Jesus, they are waiting for you with so much opposition. You know what happened some few years back in Zanzibar where they were burning some, some churches, they were shooting some priests. It's, this is just a few years ago here in Tanzania. But that's where, uh, where we are called to go. And that's where God is promising us that when we go, he's going to be with us. And when you are going somewhere or when you are trying to convince someone or when you are trying to teach someone about Jesus, plan ahead, let us know. If you feel you are going to face some opposition, let us know so that we pray for you, so that we corporately pray, because we know our brother or our sister this week is going to share the word of God, is going to share Jesus with someone who he or she must, might face opposition. So let us not be afraid. Let us not be ashamed to share the word of God. Let us boldly depend on God to share his word, to spread the gospel all around the world. That was my message today. Thank you very much. Before, before I hand over the mic to Fisher, let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word, Father. Because your word is always new every morning, Father, and your mercies and graces are always with us, Father. So we thank you so much. We thank you for uh, everything that you are doing in our life, Father. And today, specifically, Father, we pray for courage, Father, to share your gospel, Father. We pray for courage, Father, to go out there, Father, and talk about you, Father. Talk about your son, Jesus Christ, Father. Because every day, every morning, you are telling us, Father, and you are continuing to show him that, that he is the Lord. He's the King of Kings, Father. And we love his name, Father, as we've been singing, Father, because the name of Jesus is beautiful, Father. The name of Jesus is everything in our lives, Father. So as we leave this place today, Father, our eyes are fixed on Jesus Christ, Father. Our eyes are fixed on you, Father, so that we can always, always not be afraid to proclaim this name to the whole world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.